John chapter 9, we'll be reading verses 1 through 12. Uh, we'll cover this a whole chapter in a, a couple of weeks' time. This is all one story, and uh, it's a little difficult to uh, divide up into, into uh, multiple sermons. Um, it, it works and it doesn't, uh, because it really is all one story. We're going to make an attempt at the first, first 12 verses this morning. John 9, 1 through 12. Actually, I'm going to start at verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 59. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as, as, long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to see Christ in this passage and his mighty works that he demonstrates. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in chapter 9, we encounter a remarkable passage. The story itself is rightly famous, and it comes up a lot in uh, various uh, venues, uh, but the entire chapter is so tightly written, it also serves as a really great piece of literature. Uh, we won't go into all that uh, this morning, but uh, here we do see Christ's compassion for the suffering as he heals this man born blind, but also the spiritual significance that this has. The several groups of people all showing by their response to this miracle, that there are lots of different ways to be blind. We also see the various ways in which people can become invisible to us because we're so focused on our own lives that we forget them. And that's exactly what happened here. Uh, Jesus has just avoided being stoned by the Jews. Uh, he's just made this pronouncement to them uh, in no uncertain terms that he is the I Am. We brought this, up, uh, brought this up a lot uh, over the past several weeks because uh, we see all these I am statements. And when he says that, he is claiming to be the God who spoke to Moses from the burning bush. It's an act of highest blasphemy if it's not true. And so the Jews were going to run around the Roman laws at the time that said that only Romans could execute somebody. And they were picking up stones ready to stone him. They needed to be done with him, and they needed to be done with him now. But this wasn't Jesus' time. His hour had not yet come, the hour of his death, the hour when he would atone for the sins of man. So when they picked up stones to stone him, he hid himself from them. And as he's walking away, hiding, he sees a man blind from birth. And notice that we're never given a name who this is. In fact, we're rarely given the names of the people who were healed. It's nearly always a man or a woman or a child. And that's because the signs that Jesus was performing were not just for these individuals, but these individuals also represented something that was true of every person. In this case, every person is born blind, just as this man was. We see in the physical illness, the spiritual illness that it represents. If there had never been any sin in the world, right? If there was never any sin, there would never have been any blindness. His blindness is because of sin. 
just not in the way that the disciples think it is. Because they asked Jesus, who sinned that made this man blind? Him or his parents? And they assume with nearly everyone of that day that uh, if someone is born with such a serious problem, that someone must have done something wrong to deserve it. And they weren't alone here. Much of their world revolved around a sense of that if someone did something wrong, then bad things would happen to them. God would curse the disobedient in some way. And so the disciples wonder who sinned. It's a question we ask. I mean, how often do we see somebody suffering? And we assume that uh, they must have done something wrong to get like that. We might not do it in such overt ways, but in subtle ways. Because we like to know causes for things, right? We like to know uh, why uh, things happen to people. We like to think that bad things happen to bad people. Oftentimes because we think we're good people. And as long as we stay good, then bad things will happen to us. But notice how this is a way of ignoring people. It's a way of dismissing them. It's a way of saying, they're not my problem. They did this to themselves. It's a way of turning a human being made in the image of God into a theological problem to be solved. Which is what the disciples do. Notice, here's a man blind from birth. What should you think of this man who's blind from birth? And they turn him into a theological question. And they don't do it maliciously. These are Jesus' disciples, it says. These aren't uh, the Pharisees trying to trap Jesus or catch him in some kind of a, a lie or something. They're doing this just out of natural intentions, the best of intentions. Speaking out of the world in which they live, which has trained them to see people according to the flesh. Not to see people, and especially those who suffer, as people in need of help and salvation, but as problems to be solved for their own curiosity. They see the world as judgment, looking at others through their theological categories so they can place them in one camp or another. How easy it is to dismiss people, to erase them, to consider it unnecessary to deal with this person or that person because they are in a particular camp, be it theological or political or economic or ethnic or whatever way you like to divvy people up. The disciples looked at the blind man, and they saw the sinner. They didn't see him, they saw his condition. They saw a sinner, but Jesus saw a man. They were ready to judge. Jesus was ready to save. In this sense, the disciples themselves were blind. But they would become less blind as they continued to follow the light of the world, and they were about to see a bit better as Jesus brings this blind man into view. Because as Jesus says, this man isn't blind because he sinned or his parents, but so that the works of God might be displayed in him. This blind man will be used so that he and others can see Jesus. Because what is Jesus on the earth for? His ultimate purpose. He's not there to heal other people's physical ailments. If he were, then he would have had to just stay there. <laughs> Why did he go away? He healed them because, one, because that's who he is, <laughs> uh, because he has compassion on the physically ill, and because physical healing was something that the king of heaven brought with him, but healing wasn't his primary purpose in being there. His purpose was to be a savior from the spiritual death that cause blindness and lameness and everything else that afflicts us. He was there to inaugurate a kingdom, to bring people to a new life that would culminate in a new creation where there would be no blindness or any kind of disease. So while he was there, he says he was the light of the world. But when he left, he left to be the light of the new creation, the one that's just described to us in Revelation is not having any need of a son because he provided the light for that world himself. This new creation is hidden from us. It has begun in Christ's people, but it's not yet revealed in all its glory. So there's an urgency to what Jesus is doing here. His time on earth is short. So he must be doing the things that the Father sent him to do, displaying the works of God. 
And these works go beyond making people see. As Jesus says at the end of this passage, at the end of this episode, for judgment I came into the world that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. And we see this, ha and we see this happen in the reactions that occur all around this story. But first, the miracle. Jesus does something strange again. Uh, like the woman caught in adultery, once again, uh, dirt is involved, and water figures into it. He spits on the ground, and he makes clay or, or paste, you know, what you get when you spit on the dirt. People like to think it was a mud pack or something like that that they put on his eyes, but unless Jesus had just extraordinary quantities of saliva coming out of his mouth, it doesn't seem likely. <laughs> I think it was just what it was. It was enough to anoint his eyes. And, and, and sidebar, I instinctively think of him closing his eyes as Jesus puts the mud on, but that's unnecessary. You can't see anything. He puts the mud on his eyeballs. And then he tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. There's a word for eyelid. They could have used that. A few weeks ago, I mentioned that there was a water ceremony at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. And during the ceremony, water was poured from a large pitcher into a, a smaller pitcher. And connecting himself to that ceremony, Jesus said, Whoever thirsts, come to me and drink. And from him will flow rivers of living water. Just as the larger pitcher poured into the smaller one, and that smaller one had a spout where the water poured out, Christ would pour himself into his thirsty ones, and from them would flow life everlasting. Well, they drew this water for this ceremony from that pool, the pool of Siloam. Bringing even greater meaning to the word Siloam, which John points out means sin. The Father sends Jesus, who then sends the blind to the pool to wash, the very pool that represents the water of life that Jesus himself is, and the man comes back seeing. It's important to point out that his sight wasn't restored. He was given sight. He was born blind. Just as we are all born spiritually blind, he was born spiritually and physically blind. To represent that the spiritual birth is to make a new creation, Jesus takes the stuff of the old creation, dirt, the very thing that we are made of, and uses it to give this man sight. In fact, over the course of this passage, we will see that his physical sight becomes a metaphor for his being able to see Jesus more and more clearly. Because the path of the blind man, now having been saved from physical blindness, now becomes one of seeing Jesus more and more and able to see him spiritually more and more as well. We'll see most of that the next time when we look at the reaction of the Pharisees and the Jews and his parents, and even the man himself. But we want to first consider the neighbor's reaction. We've seen how the disciples regarded him as a theological problem. They didn't see him, they saw a catechism question. They saw an opportunity to judge, while Jesus saw an opportunity to save, and the neighbors react in a similar way. It's interesting that John tells us that these were neighbors, and those who had seen him before as a beggar. These are people close to him, right? These, they lived next door. They were all around him. They lived nearby. And some of them don't recognize him. Others saw him as a beggar. The implication being they, they, that's all they saw him as. The beggar. You see him as you walk by. There's this whole group of people that see him possibly on a daily basis, and they didn't know what he really looked like. They saw him, but they didn't see him. The disciples saw the blind man as a question, and the neighbors saw him like you see wallpaper. He was backdrop. It's so easy to see people like that. Shakespeare said all the world's a stage and men and women merely players, but so often the stage is our little world and we quibble with the set design and we grumble against the director's orders and we move on this stage paying attention only to our own parts. And the others that are on stage with us, they're extras. They're there for atmosphere. They fill out the scenery. 
We don't really see them. They wander in and out of our lives, and we don't pay much attention to them and to who they are. If a crime occurred to the barista or the checkout lady or the homeless man or the UPS driver or the jogger we pass every day, we'd scratch our heads trying to describe their face. But it goes beyond mere description of their face. We, who are these people? They serve us in restaurants, they bag our groceries, they cut our hair, they work with us, they go to church with us, and they're forgotten the minute we walk away. How much more so the people that we see on the street that we don't have any business with or don't want to have any business with. It's like the dismissing of the the people that the disciples did, but not because we don't like them, but because they don't matter. Now, I'm not saying you should try and strike up a relationship with the person who's Scanning your groceries. Don't do that. That's annoying. <laughs> Everyone behind me. <laughs> the point is, though, how do we consider people? Do others exist merely to fulfill our own needs or to fill out the backdrop of our lives? Or are they image bearers, in the, at least in need of grace and kindness from other image bearers and desperately in need of the good news of Jesus Christ? The blind man's neighbors didn't recognize him. Do we recognize our neighbors? Notice, too, that the blind man gaining his sight works on two levels. One is the neighbor's failure to recognize him as the formerly blind man, but the second, there's a spiritual level, what it looks like to have new spiritual sight. Some of the people said, it's him. Some said, it's not him. Some said, it's someone like him. That's kind of what it's like when you become a Christian. (laughs) You, You sort of look the same. You might dress the same. You might have the same personality. You will. The new creation looks a lot like the old one. You change on the inside, and the inside change uh, begins to look different on the outside, not necessarily in in, uh, physical changes or anything. You don't lose the ways God's made, God made you, but you do gain a new way of seeing, a new way of interpreting the world, a new obedience to God. As we'll see next time, a greater and greater clarity as to who Jesus is. And people might have a hard time recognizing him. What's amazing to me is that all this time that the neighbors are discussing whether or not it's him, John tells us that he keeps on insisting, I'm the man. They're all arguing, and he keeps saying, I'm standing right here. That's me. This works on a spiritual level and a physical level as well. On the physical level, we're being shown that in the midst of all this conversation, everyone has questions, but no one thinks this is amazing. He was blind, and now he sees. In fact, we see this everywhere in everyone's reaction. This is astonishing, it's stupendous, it's fantastic, but everyone has questions. How did this happen? Who did this to you? Who are you really? Where's the rejoicing? It's hard when good things happen that you can't take credit for sometimes. It's easy to regard the miraculous with suspicion, not just the miracle of new sight, but the miracle of new birth as well. Did he come to Jesus the right way? In the right church? Notice, too, that the man knows that Jesus healed him, but he progresses through different stages of understanding who Jesus is. At one point, we'll see that he thinks he's a prophet. Then he doesn't know if he's a sinner or not. And then he says he couldn't be a sinner because of what he did. And finally, when he meets Jesus again, he, we see his faith come to full realization. So uh, when was this man saved? Exactly. I think he was saved when Jesus restored his sight. Right then and there. We see this in the words that John uses. And again, I've said this before. Uh, all the words are there for a reason, and they're said a certain way for a reason. It's not just, uh, it's not merely uh, uh, just somebody throwing words on a page. When the neighbors are arguing about his identity, about who this man is, he doesn't actually say, or your translation probably says, I am the man. He doesn't really say that. It's the same Greek words that we've seen with Jesus over and over again. Ego a me. I am. Jesus says, do not fear. I am. He says, I am the light of the world. 
before Abraham was, I am. And this blind man says, I am. Not that he is the I am too, or is assumed any sort of equality with Jesus, but John is showing us that this man is united to Christ. His whole identity has changed. He's gone from a blind beggar on the street to a brother of the I am. That's how radical salvation, your salvation, is. It's not just an intellectual decision where you adopt a different way of thinking. It's an entirely new way of identification. You look the same, but you are not the same. Jesus doesn't welcome you into a new set of ideas. He welcomes you into a new creation. A new creation that's as different as light is from darkness. A transition from a creature of sin and death to a creature of life and righteousness. If you've been a Christian a long time, you might not notice the contrast. It gets harder the further you go to notice the contrast. Some of you have never known a day apart from Christ. Some of you have known many days apart from Christ. Some of you might not know Jesus yet. And all this might sound rather daunting. It might sound scary, having your whole world turned upside down. Imagine what it was like for this man to be blind and then to see. That's not an easy transition. To spend your entire life with nothing, and then suddenly to see all the things that have been around you your whole life. he have been like this his whole life. He'd never known anything different. And maybe you don't know anything different either. Maybe none of this sounds appealing. You don't need, think you need your sins to be forgiven. You don't think you have sins. Or maybe you think your sins are not the sort that Jesus can save you from. But if you're sitting here or watching on YouTube and, or Facebook, I want you to know that you're in exactly the right place. Think back to the beginning of our passage. Jesus was going into hiding. And he passed by and saw a man born blind. He saw him. Nobody else sees this man. Jesus saw him. And Jesus sees you. Just as he had compassion on the blind man, he has compassion for you. Just as he saved the blind man from physical and spiritual darkness, he can save you. You cannot go so far that he cannot reach you. You cannot hide so well that he cannot see you. Even the Christ that is hidden from you can still see you and save you. It won't be easy. And maybe no one will think it's amazing. But it will be wonderful. It's wonderful seeing light for the first time after a lifetime of oppressive darkness. And if you've been a Christian for a while, Jesus sees you too. He's hidden from your eyes right now. You can't see him. But he doesn't work right now primarily through sight, but through hearing his word and tasting and smelling the sacraments, the feeling of water on our heads, the bread and, bread and wine in our mouths. We see these things too, but we don't see the reality behind them, the Christ who is giving himself in them. So we see him, and yet we don't. But one, way, one day what we see by faith will become what we see with our eyes. Because we know that our Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after our skin has been thus destroyed, yet in our flesh we shall, we shall see God, and we shall see for ourselves, and our eyes shall be whole, but not another. But even as we wait for that day, though hidden, he still sees. Take your burdens to him. Lay them at his feet. Even in your confusion, in your doubts, in your own self-centeredness, in your own casting those around you as extras in the theater of your life, he still knows you and he still loves you. And he's a gracious and compassionate God who's ever ready to hear from those to whom he's given eyes to see him. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you that you have 
given us new eyes. And even though those eyes don't see everything now, even though those eyes have not been, yet been fully faith sensitized to see the spectrums of light that are invisible to us in the spiritual realms, Father, you've given us faith to lead us along, to continue to call us to yourself. I pray that you would continue to do that, that you would continue to call people to yourself, continue to heal the blind. Father, I pray that you would help us to see those around us, to see them as you see them, not as theological problems or extras in our life, but to see them as people that you've created, that you care for, who need you. I pray these things in Jesus' name.